In 1934, as part of a fundraising effort to assist in the building of new churches in suburban London, the poet T.S. Eliot wrote a play called The Rock, which revolves around the building of a new church by a group of cockney men who encouraged each other with tales of the difficulties encountered whilst attempting to serve God. The dialogue is interrupted by a chorus that's become well-known outside of the play, and the chorus poses a besetting question, asked repeatedly by humans throughout the centuries before the play and in all the years since then. And the part of the chorus goes this way. Endless invention, endless experiment, brings knowledge of motion but not of stillness, knowledge of speech but not of silence, knowledge of words but ignorance of the word, All our knowledge brings us nearer to our ignorance. All our ignorance brings us nearer to death. But nearness to death is no nearer to God. For where is life we have lost in the living? Where is the wisdom we have lost in knowledge? Where is the knowledge we have lost in information? This course has been ringing in my head all week as I reflected on the passages assigned to us by the lectionary. Each one, in their own way, commend wisdom to the people of God and warn of the dangers of puffed-up knowledge and of sharp words that are the root of deceit and destruction. Reading through all of these, we are met with the same fundamental question of human existence. How do we know what we know? And how do we know that what we think we know is trustworthy and true? How do we know what we know and how do we know that what we think we know is trustworthy and true? So for the last 200 years or so, this question has a name called epistemology, simply the study of knowledge. But minus the title, the question has been around as long as human beings have been thinking about knowledge at all. The Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy reminds us that there are several well-known avenues that this query um, has pursued. For Plato and his followers, epistemology was an an attempt to understand what we know and how knowledge, unlike just true opinion, is actually good for us, the knower. Locke took a different angle, attempting to understand the operations of human understanding. Like, how does it actually work? Kant, another direction as well, trying to understand the conditions of human understanding, like the environment, culture, worldview, that makes it possible for us to understand anything. And then Russell, even differently explores the ways in which modern science can be used to help us understand the world. And then more recently, feminist epistemology attempts to understand the ways in which interests, our own interests, affect the evidence and affect the rational constraints more generally. Now, in our modern age, particularly today, It is far more than idle intellectual curiosity that leads us to ask, how do I know what I know? And how do I know that what I know is trustworthy and true? In an age where we are flooded with information and endless competing versions of what is considered true, Articulating a baseline to address this question is really important. We are constantly presented with versions of the truth that are inviting us to action. And our actions have profound implication in the world. So deciding how to decide really matters. So, since the lectionary is what led me to this question, let's start with these little bits of Holy Scripture that we heard this morning and see what they have to offer. So, Proverbs starts with a couple of a priori assumptions. First, that God exists. And second, that God is moving in the world 
through wisdom. The writer poetically speaks of wisdom as a person with a capital W, what Christian centuries later came to call the Holy Spirit. This wisdom is leading people into proper knowledge and to our own experience of wisdom with a, cup, with a small w. But it also comes with a warning that there is a limit to capital W wisdom's patience. And if people won't listen to it, finally it will turn its back and will take some pleasure, actually, in humanity's failings. So, a bit of a dire warning. Now, the passage from the wisdom of Solomon that we sang this morning in place of a psalm continues with the praise of wisdom, of suggesting that it is the role of wisdom to connect human beings to the divine and to provide a right understanding of the world around us. And it invites people to trust the natural world around them as testimony to the existence and power of God and the role that wisdom plays in the error understanding of the world. Now James, on the other hand, resists any poetic impulses, if he had any ever to start with, just to provide two warnings in very concrete terms. First, he warns people away from being educators. So teachers, this one's for you. He says, many should not become teachers, and the reason is why, because teaching requires a lot of words, and the more you talk, the more opportunity you have to be wrong. <laughs> so this, for James, comes down to an even deeper question that goes beyond education, and it is the power of the tongue, the human tongue, to build up and to destroy. He was very afraid of this. In fact, I suppose it might have something to do with why James finally is so focused on inviting people to just stop talking and just do the work of the kingdom. Just get to it. Now in Mark, our gospel lesson, Jesus asked his disciples a very direct question. What do you know? And how do you know it? Who do people say that I am? He asks. And they come to a conclusion that he is the Messiah. And that conclusion is based on what they've seen Jesus do and what they have heard him say and all the things they thought were supposed to happen when the Messiah showed up. But their conclusions about what that meant were based on a militant view of the world, both the secular and sacred one. So as soon as they declare Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus begins to dismantle everything they thought they knew what that meant. Disabusing them of their assumptions that it would be a powerful militant Messiah. And he replaced it instead with images of suffering. His suffering. Death. His death and their coming, suffering, and death. So in these passages, we see some core philosophical starting places at work. How are we to know what we know? In these little bits of Scripture, we hear testimony of the power of empirical evidence, of appeals to tradition, of intuitive truth, and the possibility of wisdom breaking in from outside to bring and impart knowledge to us. So how do you we do it? How do you do it? And is there anything in particular that we as Anglicans might bring to this conversation that might be particularly helpful? Because you know, Anglicanism has long held that true knowledge never comes from one source alone. Instead of saying that Scripture alone is the source of all truth, or that empirical science is, has the final word, or that we simply must continue to believe all the things that we have always believed throughout time, Anglicanism had developed a way of deciding that Richard Hooker described as a three-legged stool. Now, you may remember this from your own confirmation class, so forgive me if it feels elementary. But just for the sake of today's discussion, I would like to describe this. So just picture a small three-legged stool 
that is stable upon which you could sit or stand. Each for a stool, to be a stool, all legs must be the same length, right? So one of the legs of our three-legged stool is Holy Scripture. We believe that the, uh, in the authority of Holy Scripture and it is our starting place for moral decision-making and for the lens through which we decide what is true. But Scripture alone is not enough. Scripture alone does not address all the complex questions of your particular life. So we rely on a second leg, tradition. What have the faithful believed to be true throughout the centuries? What did our forebearers believe? But again, tradition alone cannot answer all these questions because the world has changed and human beings are sinful and short-sighted, including our, for our forebearers, whom we loved. God bless those. <laughs> so therefore, there's a third leg. Remember, Anglicanism is a product of the Enlightenment. Right? So the third leg is reason, your capacity to think. But it's beyond just your ability to think. What does the empirical world teach us? What do we know intuitively, simply because we exist? And how can we use our intellectual capacity to navigate complex issues? But again, reason alone cannot lead us to the divine. And it also relies on the other two legs of the stool. So this image gives us three solid points upon which to stand. And any alone, we will tip over and fall out of the influence of wisdom. But the three together provide a trustworthy foundation upon which we can rely that will guide us into truth. Now, in addition to the strong three-legged stool of Anglicanism, Anglicanism also provides another bit of wisdom born out of pain and suffering of the English Reformation. It's known as the Via Media, the middle way. Born out of all that pain and violence, it took the church into turmoil and it tossed it to and fro. The Via Media emerged as a way to seek wisdom and truth without harming one another. It suggests that truth is rarely found on the extreme edges of things. It says that truth is rarely found on the extreme edges of things. But instead, by examining all of the evidence from multiple sources and seeking the center. From the center, there is strength and wisdom as we navigate the complexities of the world. Now, I know a 10-minute sprint through the world of poetry, philosophy, scripture, and Anglican practice may not be particularly helpful to you as you go home this afternoon and figure out all the tough stuff you're dealing with, whatever that hard thing is. But perhaps it serves as a starting place to get thinking about how will you decide how will you decide who to listen to? How will you decide what is true and trustworthy? How will you decide what is good and lovely and true? And perhaps it makes us ask, how do we know what we know? How do we know that we're on the right track? So I invite you to spend some time this week reflecting on that question. How do you decide? How do you know what is true and trustworthy? What are the foundations, the foundational concepts for you as you engage the moral dilemma of your day? I don't know, then perhaps commending a particularly Anglican way of approaching moral decision-making may in fact be helpful. As we explore the world of Holy Scripture, as we plunge into the thinking of those who have come before us and apply our serious intellectual and intuitive reason to the questions of the day, perhaps we emerge with a solid foundation for decision-making. And by committing ourselves to finding the via media, the middle way, 
we commit to remaining peacefully connected to one another as we decide. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.